They say when you wear Black Power Media gear, you can accomplish anything. You play any and every position. Coaching, to kicking, to receiving, to running and juking. And, oh, my goodness. Let's see that again in slow motion. Get off me. Ah. And you're going to have a lot of haters coming at you. But what you got to do is you got to shake them off. Shake them off and get to your goal and accomplish it. And when that's done, it's a beautiful thing. I'm talking about going hard, extra, for that extra point. And when it's done beautifully, you're talking about touchdown. Oh, and the crowd goes wild and they're celebrating with you and everything. Man, let's see that again. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. That's how we do it. Now go to blackpowermedia.org and get you some of that gear. Power yourself today. Yeah. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Yes, 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 yes. Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here at Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball broadcasting, you know, from the hideaways out here <laughs> in between classes. You know how we have to do it sometimes. Greetings to everybody. Welcome on this very special Hubert Henry Harrison Black Socrates edition of I Mix What I Like. Professor Brian Quoba is going to join us in a few minutes, uh, and, and as soon as he does, I will bring him up. And just off the top, Brian Quoba is an assistant professor at the University of Memphis in the Department of History with research interests that include African-American political thought, social movements, and the politics of race, class, and gender across the African diaspora. Uh, we have a lot we can talk about that emanates from Harrison. Um, and I look forward to getting into all of that on what would be his, uh, that is Harrison's 140th birthday, born on this date in 1883 in St. Croix, Virgin Islands. And uh, would of course make much of his impact in Harlem where he is considered still the father of Harlem radicalism. So uh, welcome as everybody starts to come on in. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Greetings, everyone, to the remixers. Very quickly, uh, while we have this moment, I did want to share once again um, this very exciting development uh, here at Morgan State, uh, known as the Black Underground, um, with a home here on Instagram. Uh, definitely want to raise them up. I, um, uh, I want to say on some level, I'm, I'm happy that I don't know anything about this group and have nothing to do with the group. Uh, but on the other hand, I admit a little bit of, you know, like, you know, like this, this is exciting, you know? So most recently they have a post here about, uh, their concern over, uh, the, increasing police state and militarization of the campus, um, how Morgan is becoming a police state, our primary pillars of action, raise campus social, economic, and political consciousness. We will achieve this by hosting twice a week meetings for discussions and educational seminars for our peers to share and, or learn more about Black liberation. We plan to aggressively defend student and faculty from corruption and tyranny in the administration and its various affiliated organizations. This will be done by protests, occupations, and demonstrations. Pillar three is to complete community service praxis by working in conjunction with pro-Black organizations in Baltimore City's working class Black communities. We will be working towards raising the collective consciousness of Black people in Baltimore City. We plan to use Instagram as a means of communication to our campus, as a means of announcements, and as a means of educating the masses. We will also critique MSU on anything we deem to be corrupt. 
very interesting. So definitely keep an eye out and uh, wish them well in their endeavors, you know? So right on. Um, okay, so it looks like our guest is here. Very good. Uh, and again, I'll, I will, we all can pay attention and see what we hear about happening with these. And if I hear anything happening uh, here on campus, I will definitely share and uh, right on. It's nice to see some underground press development. One other thing, speaking of, um, well, Morgan State in my hip hop class, uh, Musa, I don't know if they'll see this, but Musa, you uh, apparently attempted to set me up by the suggestion of the uh, rapper Cupcake as a potential for our Bechtel test. Uh, I haven't even listened and just mentioning the name to my students caused a raucous, uproarious, response of laughter and when i i was like i don't even know who this person is and they said um the 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 one the one comparison i remember was uh they said dr ball do you know trina and i said yeah i remember trina they said imagine trina by a thousand or a million and i said whoa i said so they said there there is no possible way any of their songs will pass the bechtel test that they had created so anyway musa apparently and then they said Musa, you set me up. So, you know, anyway, appreciate you. Uh, uh, yeah, that was that was slick. Anyway, without further ado, let's 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 quickly uh, 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 bring up our guest, Dr. Brian Quoba, again, already introduced here to talk with us about Hubert Henry Harrison, the original Triple H. Dr. Quoba, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. I'm not sure what time it is. I'm not even sure where you are, what time it is, where you are. I barely know what time it is where I am, but it's good to see you. Good morning. Greetings. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, sir. It's a pleasure to be on the show again uh, after some eight years, I think. Um, oh, yeah. that's, well, right. Well, that's right, because when you, you if I remember correctly, I'm, I wasn't there the day you were on with uh my my then uh comrade and co-host dr hate if i remember correctly right he right, hosted right. You on that one so i it, this is the first time that that we've gotten to build so i appreciate that big shout out um to to uh josh and Aaliyah for again helping put this together because we had been going back and forth separately trying to figure this out then they reached out and fi you figured it yeah, out with them yeah. so this is all perfect so thank you yeah, very much well, well thank you dr ball it's truly an honor to be on and, this show i've been following you for years and years and years loving all the content loving all the stuff you bring in um it's truly an honor to be here i'm i'm, I'm so excited and i have to also say before we get much further a big happy birthday to hubert henry harrison That's today right. is his birthday and so we're going to be celebrating his life and legacy uh, on a very appropriate day to do so. That's right. And I and I had calculated, I think it's 140 he would have been today, right? 1883, yes. right? 1883, so, that's correct. So, well, let's start there. I mean, let's let's get into it. I mean, you've, you've, first of all, let's do this because you, I believe, even went to the services for the now late uh, Jeffrey Perry. Uh, yes. And mm -hmm. who we've hosted here and who has been among, if not the leading scholar on the history of Hubert Henry Harrison in terms of the production of, of work about him, um, uh, at least in the, among that group. Uh, and yeah. uh, so we, we, we respect and, and appreciate that work. Um, would you want to say a word about Perry as you, as you segue into a discussion of, of Harrison? Sure, sure. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's been a journey. You know, I, I first met uh, Perry, I believe it was at the at the Left Forum in New York back in around 2009, 2010, somewhere thereabouts. And, um, you know, he just had all this enthusiasm for Harrison. He was sharing at that time, he was sharing his first the first volume of the two volume biography that he's written on Harrison. And uh, so I got a copy, started reading, became so enthralled and, and interested in Harrison and wondering why more people didn't know about him, that um, it really set me on the path that I've been on now. Uh, first, you know, going to grad school, uh, doing my dissertation on Harrison, uh, my PhD dissertation, and, and then, you know, so on and so forth up to working on the book now. But um, yeah, Perry is a towering uh, scholar, was a towering scholar, you know, may he rest in power. 
Um, I'm grateful for all the hard work that he's done, you know, decades upon decades of research into the life and work of Hubert Harrison, um, you know, really someone who I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of um, in so many ways. And just, uh, I would not know about Harrison, frankly, if it wasn't for Perry. And I think that's true of many folks, you know, um, despite the efforts that came before him, you know, to try to preserve Harrison's memory and, and keep him alive. Um, Perry has really done, you know, more work than, than anybody I'm aware of. Uh, to really lift up Harrison, to celebrate, to honor him, to bring him to a new audience for a new generation in a new century. So, um, yeah, I, I have. Uh, yeah, I mean, building, definitely building on, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the, the the earliest work that I remember, at least, you know, in terms of mentions of Harrison, that would be, you know, like J.A. Rogers. Uh, um, and then then the generation after that, which, uh, you know, John Henry Clark and that crew. But in terms of producing, um, uh the volumes of work mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, about Harrison, uh, it, we we do we do owe Perry a, a debt there. And then, as he pointed out, that part of Perry's interest was that uh, was that working class perspective. Uh, was so it was it was it's it's not just uh, ivory tower scholarship as is often dismissed in in academia. It was uh, from the perspective of of um, uh, white, you know, admittedly, but albeit, uh, you, know, all, you know, but but nonetheless, uh, uh, radical labor, working class perspective. So, yes, um, yeah, most definitely, he was a yeah. he was a retired postal worker. You know, mm -hmm. had put decades in in the labor movement, organizing postal workers. Uh, you know, he's a veteran of the 1960s generation, so definitely um, had a lot of of you know, kind of socialist and progressive, anti racist. Um, commitments um, as demonstrated by his work and his life. And the memorial I went to um, just a couple months ago in February was really beautiful because, you know, it really painted a picture of Perry's um, sort of his legacy and the people he knew. I mean, he was connected to the, the Kochiyama family, right? Yuri Kochiyama um, and those folks. He was connected to um, labor, you know, obviously a lot of labor organizers, union organizers um, in the New York, New Jersey area. Um, two of Hubert Harrison's descendants were at Perry's memorial. One of his uh, granddaughters and one of his great granddaughters, um, Yvette Richard, wow. uh, Richardson. And so, um, so yeah, it was an honor to be there. And um, and I'm I'm definitely building on on the work and 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 the, the scholarship uh, that Perry has produced. So if we if 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 I can, you know, we if we if we segue from there to to talk more about Harrison himself, sort of even following his own political trajectory from from you know sort of starting with white radicalism of sorts and then moving into ever increasingly radical blackness and Africanity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, let's 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 do that. What what have you found that has attracted you so much? To, to Harrison uh, as a figure and as a, as a uh, yeah, as a historical figure. Um, yeah, let's well. Talk, let's talk about that. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, there's a number of things in Harrison's sort of life and, and political trajectory that I can relate quite directly to. Um, you know, for example, I myself uh, was in a socialist organization for a number of years, uh, you know, predominantly white socialist organization, uh, the ISO. Uh, and, you know, it, it was an experience where I, I certainly learned a lot of politics, learned a lot of theory, learned a lot of history. Um, for example, history of the Russian Revolution. I feel like I should have a, a master's degree, <laughs> at least in the history of the Russian Revolution. But um, but at the same time, you know, as 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 I know, you've spoken a lot about and given airtime to on the show, um, the white left has a number of problems, especially when it comes to race, when it comes to questions of of Pan-African politics, pro-black politics. Um, and so that was something that, you know, after I left uh, that organization way back in 2010, um, I, I certainly learned a lot more about. I mean, one of the first things I did was read the Black Jacobins, uh, which totally blew my mind um, in terms of, you know, Black revolutionary history. Um, but there's other things in Harrison's life I can relate to as well. I mean, Harrison was fired from his job as a postal worker for his politics, right, for speaking out against Booker T. Washington. And um, I myself was fired uh, from my job teaching high school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, for my politics and my activism with students. 
Um, another example uh, that I might want to, that I could speak to is, um, you know, Harrison uh, became a sort of African conscious thinker, right? Identifying with Africa, celebrating um, all, all that Africa has to offer, particularly to black people, you know, in the diaspora, people of African descent in the diaspora. And, um, and, and I think that's something that as well, I've, I've been on a journey to discover, you know, my dad's side, I'm Kenyan on my dad's side, and I've been traveling to Kenya over the past uh, 15 years or so, um, about once a year on average and really deepening and, and sort of connecting with my identity there. Um, and so, you know, the, these, are, these are some of the ways that I, I can relate to Harrison's story and his, his sort of life experience, his, his, uh, his political and ideological trajectory. Um, and I think it sets me up to, to, to tell his story or to interpret his story uh, to some degree um, in ways that are, that are very specific. You know, I, I'm looking at um, his, his politics, his, his black masculinity, um, you know, any number of things that, um, that not too many scholars have been able to or, or you know, have chosen to focus on thus far, um, those, those who have done work on Harrison. Now that's interesting. I, I'm not. Yeah, I haven't. The the the. Where where are you with his with his uh, with with Harrison and masculinity? What what is where are you with that? That's yeah. Well, <laughs> first for me. Yeah. So so one of the big um, the big things I was able to do the biggest thing I was able to do I was I was on a fellowship in New York last year uh, the Schomburg Center Fellowship. Um, you know. Uh, thanks to to the institution there named for Arturo Schomburg, who was such a close friend of Harrison um, and, and which Harrison worked so hard to build up as, you know, a library branch, 135th Street Harlem branch of the New York Public Library. Um, I was able to write a new chapter uh, that I didn't have in my Ph.D. dissertation about what I call Harrison's black free love politics. Um, Harrison, you know, was uh, married and he had children um, and he was also a free lover. And he was, you know, he spoke openly uh, in favor of access to abortion um, and birth control uh, access. He spoke about sex education. Uh, he had a whole series of lectures on sex and sexuality uh, that he would give. And he was a free lover, you know, he, he cultivated um, connections and loving romantic relationships with, with a number of people um, and had a politics to that, you know, in terms of connecting capitalism and colonialism and white supremacy to compulsory monogamy. Um, this is, again, sort of an under-researched area in general, <laughs> you know, uh, when it comes to black history and black politics. Um, but he wasn't the only one doing this, you know, there's there's a number of other figures who who were. It's just been sort of on the down low and kept quiet oftentimes because of the taboo on discussing sex and sexuality um, and certainly the the additional burdens as black people um, of always being hyper sexualized by the dominant culture in the first place and repressed and attacked and experiencing violence, sexual violence, whether it's, you know, the rape of of black women in the Jim Crow South by their uh, employers or the lynching and castration of uh, black men, you know, in the same period. And so um, I think it's, it's a really fascinating and under appreciated aspect of um, people like Harrison that they could develop a politics to push back against the criminalization of sexuality by the state did Perry talk about, did, I don't remember any of this in Perry. I haven't read it incredibly closely or as close enough to be like a, a, certainly a critic of it, of Perry's work, but I don't recall any of this discussion. You're saying, so he talked about uh, uh, reproductive rights, abortion. You're saying yeah. he, he, he was a defender of that. When you say a, 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 a free lover, are you, are you saying that, that he had, he and his wife had an open marriage of sort? Is this what you're talking about? Like, what are, no, we, what are, we, what no. are we, what are we saying here? Like, what, what no, <laughs> this is fascinating. <laughs> and, then, and then did he? And then, and then, in addition, as you as you respond, did he also did he comment on on uh, uh, um, well, obviously on gender, but on sexuality? Did he have? Did he speak openly about uh, his thoughts on homosexuality uh, um, and beyond? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's fascinating, right? <laughs> um, yeah, Perry doesn't really doesn't get into 
any of this. I mean, he does mention that Harrison, you know, is having affairs uh, with a number of different women. Um, Perry certainly does mention that Harrison was advocating uh, for access to birth control um, and was, you know, an early voice, uh, certainly an early black voice in that. In that, <laughs> so I'm sorry. So when you say free lover, he was he was free with his love. Is is is, is what was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, what well, it wasn't an open marriage. Um, in right, fact, this right. was this was, I think, the central point of tension uh, with his mm -hmm. wife, Lynn uh, Irene Harrison, um, because you know he was he was a free lover before he met her, um, and I don't know if they had any conversation when they decided to get married about this, but um, he continued to be a free lover afterwards, and it, it caused a lot of tension. It caused a lot of issues um, in the home. And it's something that I, I, I go into, you know, in the chapter that I wrote uh, and that's coming in my in my forthcoming book. But um, but, you know, I mean, we have to remember this was a period in Harlem in the early 20th century, you know, 1910s and especially in the 1920s, even more so, where there's a whole flowering and burgeoning of multiple uh, black sexualities, you know, um, and people who are experimenting in a lot of ways as part of what we call, you know, the so-called Harlem Renaissance. Um, you know, there's a whole number of artists, you know, blues singers, for example, blues women, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, um, folks like that who are, who are, you know, singing songs that embrace sexuality, that embrace women's independence and bodily autonomy, um, things of that nature. There's, you know, the buffet flats and, the, you know, all these spaces where there's, there's queer cultures emerging in the black community there. Um, and so the context is, is very much kind of um, opening up in that sense, again, from a very, very, very repressive, it's, it's hard, I think, for us to imagine how repressive, it, you know, sex was treated a century ago. I mean, birth, birth control and contraception was illegal. Um, anal sex, oral sex were illegal, right? Sex work was illegal. Um, any literature, erotica, or even just information about sex education was illegal um, and the Comstock laws of the late 19th century um, set up the government to persecute people um, who were even just trying to, 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 uh, to, to, to spread information about sex, sex and sexuality, not to mention the role of the church, right, which had an extremely repressive and sex negative morality um, that was infused within the culture um, in addition to the, the racial pressures on black folks that I already mentioned. And so, um, so yeah, Harrison has an interesting relationship to all this because um, it's a bit contradictory, right? On the one hand, he, he's, he's speaking about this subject and he has, again, what I call a black, a sort of radical black free love politics. Um, and at the same time, there's moments where, you know, he sort of um, is a little bit uncomfortable sometimes about what he's seeing. Um, like, for example, he goes to a, he goes to a, an annual um, dance for Virgin Islanders. Um, Harrison himself was a Virgin Islander and was active, you know, in the, in the Virgin Islander community in Harlem. Um, he goes to a dance and he, he makes a comment about how um, there are so many women, um, sort of, you know, same gender loving women there. Um, and it seems like you might interpret his comment as a kind of homophobic comment. But then on the other hand, he cultivated friendships with people like Claude McKay and Bruce, uh, Richard Bruce Nugent, you know, who are some of the, the sort of notably queer figures of, of the Harlem Renaissance era. And, um, and Harrison had a huge, I mean, by, 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 according to Nugent, Harrison had the largest collection of erotica of anybody in New York. <laughs> so he certainly had a wide range of, um, a, a wide sense of possibility in terms of what was out there, you know, sexually and, and in terms of, um, you know, sort of sexuality in, in, a, in a subculture that, that was defying the criminalization of erotic literature and, and sex more generally. Wow. All right, right on. Okay, so what what would but do you recall what his comment was that could be interpreted as as homophobic, and then mm. like mm -hmm. what? Um, yeah. Anyway, I was just curious. That was interesting, though. That was. I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, what he basically said. I'm just gonna try to pull it up here. Um, he basically yeah, he said. Uh, so this was this was a. 
the meeting of the Virgin Islands uh, Congressional Council, which was having its annual dance. Um, this was a, an organization that would sort of lobby politicians on behalf of Virgin Islanders. And um, they were having their annual dance and, and fundraiser. Uh, and he, 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 was, he had mentioned how the dance, he felt like it was, de he said it was uh, degenerating more and more into a tribade's annual, where about a third or more of the dancers on the floor are made up of female couples. couples. This homosexual tendency is very strongly pronounced among Virgin Islands women. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it seems a bit homophobic. I mean, maybe he's just talking about the fact that he doesn't have as many dance partners because all the women there are partnering up with other women. Um, but as I said, you know, he had he had close friendships with people like Claude McKay. I mean, Cla hey, Hubert Harrison is one of the few figures who Claude McKay mentions on more than one occasion in his autobiography. Um, as a friend and as a mentor. Um, and, you know, McKay, you know, was a Jamaican radical Marxist, um, bisexual, although not not necessarily openly, uh, you know, open about it. Um, and, and other figures, you know, uh, that I mentioned. So, so it's, a, it, again, there's a sort of contradictory aspect to, I think, some of what Harrison is saying and, 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 um, and relating to, but also, you know, very radical in many ways as well, in terms of um, really thinking deeply about and studying deeply. I mean, he studied European sexology and the sort of literature that European social science was creating um, about sex and sexuality. And, and he had a critique of, of the whiteness of science, right? And of the Eurocentrism of um, European social science and, and the, the sort of scientific, quote unquote, scientific racism uh, that was so prominent in his day. Um, he had an African-centered concept of gender and sexuality. You know, he, he, he makes reference, for example, to folks like Edward Wilmot Blyden, um, a fellow Virgin Islander, Pan-Africanist intellectual who, um, who had written about African life and customs um, and the, the system of plural marriage, for example, that many African societies um, you know, had exhibited and, and still even to this day uh, allow for, that is, you know, non-monogamous or m multiple marriage, polygamous marriages, essentially, right? Um, and, and so, yeah, there's, there's all these elements that are going into Harrison's thinking about this. Um, you know, I mean, the Marxist and socialist uh, arguments about the, the struggle for free love as a struggle against capital, right? The way in which, uh, you know, basically this this notion of monogamy and, and sort of, um, well, monogamy for women only, <laughs> right, which is often how it's practiced, um, was about ensuring that the descendants of the ruling class could be identified clearly so that you know who to bequeath the property to to the next generation, right? Um, that these are bound up in class society in, in sort of the, the political, economic, um, and cultural forces. I mean, Harrison was a free thought, you know, was a leading black figure in the free thought movement, criti criti critical of the church, critical of Christianity. Um, and he saw Christianity in many ways as a, as a mechanism of social control, which among other things had a very conservative and sex negative morality. He talked about the, the puritanic prudes <laughs> and, uh, you know, the impact of uh, puritanism and sort of this, this prudishness, uh, what he called erotic bashfulness of American culture. Um, you know, let me stop you there real quick because I did have to a note here to ask you what you what what role do you think his his uh tendencies towards atheism uh and I don't recall how how full blown he did he refer to himself as an atheist did he self refer as, as, as he he identified most often in my research as a as an agnostic. Mm -hmm. um, there are other other sort of commenters who would refer to him as atheist, um, and perhaps he may have he may have identified that way at, at certain moments. Well, because I want I, I mean, specifically, I wanted to ask you what you thought about that, and in, in also in terms of of how he's remembered or not remembered. Uh, do you do you do you think that there's any in addition to many other of the isms he could have been marginalized for? Do you think that 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 atheism could be one of them uh, yeah. in terms of how even within black communities we remember him or don't? Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely, yeah. I mean, at the time, you know, there was what was called the free thought movement. Right. There were free thinkers. And that was a broad sort of designation it included agnostics. It included atheists. It included P 
people who, you know, had some type of critique or skepticism towards the church um, and, and, a, and a sort of anti-clerical orientation, um, generally speaking, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, Harrison is um, certainly, I think certainly his, his, his popularity or maybe his accessibility uh, for black communities may have been limited by that, given the prominent role that the church plays and has played in so many black communities, um, church and or mosque, right? Um, and Harrison actually saw Islam as, as favorable to, more favorable or, or more preferable for black people than Christianity um, for a number of reasons. But, um, but yeah, I mean, he was, he, this was, this for, was one of the, 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 the issues that I think he was first kind of confronted with, right? Coming out of St. Croix in the Caribbean, uh, you know, which like many, ang many countries in the, in the Anglo-Caribbean was, was generally Christian. Um, you know, he'd had some training in the Anglican church, uh, as a child, you know, before he gets to New York in 1900 at the age of 17. And, um, and he, you know, he's in the lyceums and these, these debate spaces where, where religion, uh, is really a, a major sort of area where where people were becoming more critical and radicalizing in a lot of ways um reminds me of the quote from marx where he talks about how you know a break with religion is like the first step towards more general critical thought or something something to that nature i'm forgetting the quote exactly but um but yeah i think black communities um are often um you know quite religious and, and church or mosque oriented which which has perhaps limited his accessibility in certain ways um uh, among among other things that <laughs> you know have have made him iconoclastic um, and and a little more difficult to digest for, for, for some folks. So I was trying to uh, I, I, I didn't have enough time to to do it properly, um, uh, but if if I was trying to 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 well the question is where did how where does Harrison fit as you see it in the Garvey, Briggs, Du Bois, YouTube battle of the early 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, this is a this is a great question. Um, and one that I've I've kind of been trying to follow as, as best as I can, you know, on your program, certainly. Um, but you know, I think one of the first things that that I would say about that is that Harrison is an extremely big influence um, on this generation and on this this moment, you know, of the early 20th century, particularly black black folks like the ones you're mentioning. Um, so to start with Garvey, for example, um, Garvey. I mean, Harrison. I have a, a whole article, uh, journal article about this in the Journal of African American History. Um, about Harrison and the Garvey movement and how Harrison plays a key, key role um, in the rise of Garvey and Garveyism. Um, because when Garvey first comes to the U.S., you know, uh, in 1916, he is, um, he's trying to build a Tuskegee-style institute in Jamaica. You know, we often forget this, um, but that was the initial objective of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. He wanted a Tuskegee-style institute for industrial education in Jamaica. And he was writing letters to Booker T. Washington. Um, he was appealing to Tuskegee for funds to help start this, this brick and mortar school in Jamaica. Um, he tours the country, he, he encounters Hubert Harrison in 1917 when he gets uh, to New York and he's down and out. Garvey is down and out, he's out of money. He's toured the country for a year. He's, he, he, um, he's about to go back to Jamaica <laughs> and uh, and he meets Hubert Harrison, and he ends up um, joining Harrison on the stage as Harrison is launching his Liberty League of Negro Americans in June of 1917 in Harlem. And Harrison has already done the preparatory work, both in terms of the ideology of race first, um, which is a really, really key aspect of Garveyism, right? This notion of race first and the, the doctrine and politics of race first. Garvey was 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 celebrating all the white support that he that the UNIA had had from 1914 to 1916, um, 
and and Harrison is teach, telling telling a whole different story because Harrison, unlike Garvey, had the experience of dealing with the white first politics of the Democratic Party and Woodrow Wilson, the white first politics of the Republican Party and the Tuskegee machine and all of that, the white first politics of the Socialist Party um, and his efforts, you know, ultimately that did not succeed to push the Socialist Party in a, in a more race conscious direction. Uh, or at least a, a more pro-black direction. And so Harrison by 1915 has already concluded that black people are, are not going to be advanced by white political formations, uh, that we have to work on, on our, our own behalf, as, as he was arguing. And so Garvey encounters that and totally shifts his perspective, not only in terms of race first and abandoning the Tuskegee model of appealing to you know elite whites to fund a industrial education school. Um, and instead, Garvey develops a mass movement orientation, which again, coming out of the Liberty League, you know, Garvey joins Harrison's Liberty League. That's another key fact that a lot of Garvey scholars have either missed or minimized that uh, Garvey joins Harrison's Liberty League and he learns a whole lot of political and sort of or organizational um, ideas and orientations, the mass movement orientation, right? The race first politics, the African consciousness. The UNIA initially had a program uh, that was talking about uplifting and civilizing the backward tribes of Africa, um, but that was not really a serious commitment or objective in terms of the Tuskegee model of education that Garvey initially wanted. Um, certainly it becomes way more prominent in, in Garvey's thinking um, again, thanks to Hubert Harrison and the work that Harrison was doing to educate black people in Harlem about Africa, about the need yeah. to learn from Africa. And I know he wrote a lot. That is Harrison on the subject. There were, but what is what am I remembering that I, I did? And, and unfortunately, I did read it and just but it was a small, a, a smaller book that Harrison wrote. Um, the Negro and the Nation. Possibly. But did it. But what I remember is what I remember. Wait, say that again. When Africa awakes. That's the one. That's yeah. the one. I don't think I read the Negro in the Nation because because I'm thinking specifically to your point here about his um, finding uh, importance in the need for you know African consciousness and an understanding of, of the diaspora and, and a relationship mm -hmm. uh, and the 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 uh, contribution to civilization so called uh, yeah. uh, of yeah. African people. So that would have been okay. And if I remember correctly, he wrote that in, in the early twenties. Nineteen twenty. Yeah. Okay. There it is. Okay, there's a, a little bit of memory still lasting here, le left over. But anyway, yeah, go ahead. yeah that was yeah, okay, so, right on. That, so that book, um, I'll, I'll, I could just say a little bit about, I mean, that book, one of the things that's interesting about that book is, is um, in my reading of it, he's publishing When Africa Awakes, which is really um, the most important of the two books, the more important of the two books that he publishes, Harrison. Um, he puts it out in August of 1920. And for those who, you know, are, are in on the, the ground floor of Garvey movement history, that's the first international convention of the UNIA. Um, and I think he's publishing that book in an effort to try to push the UNIA in a more class conscious and anti-imperialist direction. Um, because, you know, Garvey had very much a conception of building a black empire on the basis of capital accumulation. And he's explicit about this, right? Garvey, um, I mean, Garvey's a contradictory figure. I think he's extremely important. I think we can't actually underestimate <laughs> or overstate how important Garvey and Garveyism are to Pan-African uh, figures like Jomo Kenyatta, Kwame Nkrumah, um, a whole generation of folks, right? Amy Ashwood Garvey, Amy Jakes Garvey. I mean, these folks um, are really influencing things that, that will continue into the 20th century. I mean, the flag of Ghana, for example, has a black star in the middle of it because Kwame Nkrumah was explicit about the influence, right, that Garvey had on him, the impact Garvey had on him. And the black star line was certainly one of the big um, sort of propaganda um, and sort of economic um, features of, of the Garvey movement. But in any case, this book, When Africa Awakes, that Harrison writes, it has a lot of his socialist editorials, a lot of his anti-imperialist uh, editorials, right? A lot of his political, his calls for, for Black people to take political action, to organize politically, 
Um, and so he's trying to push the UNIA from within as editor of the Negro World, which is the Garvey Movement newspaper. Um, Harrison is trying to use that influence um, to push the UNIA in a more class conscious and anti-imperialist um, and politically engaged direction in 1920. Um, and that's, I think, uh, very, very important because it's part of a whole number of other things that he's doing, as I, as I explain in the book, um, to try and shift the UNIA from, from what Garvey's kind of conception is in terms of um, some of the, the black capitalism and black imperialism um, in a different direction. He, you know, Harrison had a very different conception of race first um, than Garvey ultimately adopted. So you mentioned as well um, Briggs mm -hmm. Boyce and some of these right. Other I was trying to right trying to situate Harrison in that that yeah. So, so Du Bois, um, you know, Harrison initially is is influenced by Du Bois. I mean, Du Bois is you know his elder, um, you know, and so Harrison in the early 1900s he he's he's writing you know positive things about Du Bois, um, acknowledging right the role that Du Bois is playing um, in terms of breaking with the mold of of the, the Booker T. Washington type of accommodationist politics. Um, and Harrison is, is also pushing Du Bois even as a socialist. Um, there's a moment where Du Bois is in the Socialist Party with Harrison at the same time. And, um, you know, but I think the biggest clash that, that or the biggest moment of breaking with Du Bois is during World War I, um, which, which, you know, Du Bois scholars tend to avoid <laughs> that subject because Du Bois, you know, was pro-war. He ended up uh, writing that editorial, Close Ranks, calling on Black people to close ranks and forget our special grievances. Uh, in order to win the war, uh, you know, and support the U.S. in World War I, even though prior to that he had been the principal voice of our special grievances, you know, which included issues with lynching, obviously disfranchisement, Jim Crow segregation, um, and other forms of racial oppression. And so Harrison exposes the fact that Du Bois uh, had applied to become a captain in military intelligence in order to spy on black radicals, right? To monitor what they called neo Negro subversion during the um, you know, patriotic fervor of, of World War I um, and the intense state repression that the Espionage and Sedition Acts uh, had created where literally anti-war dissent was, was criminalized and prohibited and people went to jail. Eugene Debs went to jail. Uh, Chandler Owen and, and A. Philip Randolph, you know, um, were arrested for speaking against the war, World War One, and so um, and so. Yeah, Harrison plays a role in, in exposing Du Bois's pro-war position, which which weakened his uh, weakened Du Bois's authority um, for a while in the black community. You know, I mean, he tries to get it back after the war, saying, you know, all right, the war's over, we we return from fighting, and we return fighting fighting against the forces of hell in our own land. Um, but the damage, a lot of damage was done, you know, by Du Bois's decision to, um, to attempt to join the government essentially and, um, and abandon his, his criticisms of racial, racial oppression and imperialist domination. Um, so I think after that moment, you know, we see Harrison and Du Bois really diver diverging in a lot of ways, even though they'd been in many ways on the same page uh, about the African roots of the war, about the imperialist roots of the war, about um, the need to fight racial oppression, lynching, disfranchisement, segregation in the US um, and things of that nature. Briggs, um, there's, so then there's a whole generation of, of black, black Marxists, right? First black socialists and then later black communists who are also coming out of um, this, this sort of groundwork that Harrison in many ways has, has helped to cultivate in Harlem in terms of, of his role as a, as, a black, as a pioneer of black Marxist theory and practice within the Socialist Party. So first you have figures like A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen who are um, joining the Socialist Party around 1917, 1918, this the same time, um, building in many ways on work that Harrison had done um, to try to push the Socialist Party to organize Black workers, um, to take their concerns seriously, right? Um, or Harrison had tried to set up the, uh, the Colored Socialist Club in Harlem, which was the first official party formation in the Socialist Party that was Black-led. It was multiracial, but it was a Black-led formation, you know, specific to Harlem that Harrison was spearheading. Um, 
and then Briggs, people like Cyril Briggs, and then some others, you know, Richard B. Moore, Grace, Grace P. Campbell, um, W.A. Domingo. Um, these are some of the folks who will join the Socialist Party around this time. And then when the Communist Party is formed out of a break, sort of a left wing break out of the Socialist Party, um, these are the first generation. Uh, th these are the first generation of black communists uh, in Harlem. And they all openly, you know, acknowledged Harrison's influence on them, the role that he played uh, in, in sort of inspiring them and teaching them from the street corner speaking and outdoor stepladder oratory that Harrison was also quite, quite um, important in inaugurating this tradition in Harlem. And, and Harrison works with them. For example, in 1921, uh, the second annual convention of the UNIA, um, Harrison called a meeting of the so-called Black Reds, um, people like Claude McKay and Richard B. Moore and Grace Campbell, folks who would who who had formed the African Blood Brotherhood, um, this kind of revolutionary, you know, Pan-Africanist socialist formation. He was he was trying to get them together to see if they could make the Garvey movement more class conscious, and so they end up, uh, you know, attempting to. Um, basically intervene in or in influence uh, intentionally that second convention of the UNIA. Um, and, you know, as, as socialists uh, often do, they, they were, I think, a little bit overbearing. Um, no. No, no, I, no. I, 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 Brian, I need you to go back and check your research on that. <laughs> man. That's it. There's simply no way. There's of, no way. Uh, socialists. Black as they may be, were overbearing. I, I no, no, no can't, never. It would never can't be possibly. polemical or you know overbearing <laughs> or try to bludgeon anybody with their ideas. Uh, uh. So, Gar so Garvey flips on them, right? Garvey just kicks them all out of the convention, and it's from that moment on. I think that Garvey really has has uh, some issues with with black communists um, or communists generally, black or white, <laughs> um, and it's unfortunate because. You know, so much more work could have been done if folks could have found a way to get together. The, the Garveys and Du Boises and Briggses and Harrisons of the world, um, and and you know, women too, like Grace Grace Campbell and Williana Burroughs and um, Eslanda Cardoza Good, the, the mother of uh, this, Paul Robeson's future wife, Eslanda Eslanda Good. Um, you know, there, there's there's so much more that could have been done if if these folks could have could have found a way to work together, you know? Um, but as is often the case, we see the kind of HNIC. Hold on, hold on, I'm sorry, hold on. Message! <laughs> I mean, I mean, I feel like, I know we said it's his 140th birthday, but I feel like, my God, if that is not a 2023 analysis or, or point to be made <laughs> if only <laughs> anyway my bad yeah. sorry about that the hnic you were that's where you were headed yeah oh man goodness. but it's true i mean i mean and that's what's so fascinating about studying harrison um is that so much of what i have learned through through studying him is so relevant and so applicable right now today in the 21st century um you know uh i mean the, yeah anyway i i <laughs> So one of the one of the examples of that, right, is is this kind of um, this issue of of top down forms of leadership. You know what what Ella Baker uh, called leader centered groups. Um, Ella Baker said we need we need act what we need is group centered leaders rather than leader centered groups. And I think that you know kind of message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, just, it's, my bad. It's, yeah, listen. That's, that's bars, but that is bars. I mean, I mean, seriously, seriously, yeah. folks, come on, man. Come on. Anyway, please. Come yeah. on. Yeah. So, so, um, so, yeah. Some of these personalities, whether it's Du Bois, whether it's Garvey, um, you know, whether it's the Communist Party, and just the kind of general. Um, top-down or bureaucratic way of organizing where, um, you know, somebody at the top sets the, sets the agenda and everybody else is kind of supposed to fall in line with it. 
um, that has really held us back. Oh man, if, just, 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 just at least one more time. Message. It's just, it's just so <laughs> I can't say it so enough. You, you, you were talking about, um, and unfortunately, I already uh, we, we're going to have to wrap this a little bit early because I do have class and um, one of four. Just mm. putting that out there, just mm. throwing that out there. One of four this, that I teach this semester um, mm. and every semester for almost 20 years. Just 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 saying. Just, just saying. <laughs> um, but but I was looking at back at Perry's work again at sort of the 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 concluding chapters. And it was it's it's just fascinating to be reminded of where Harrison was headed uh, towards the end of his life. And um, in this section here, oh, I forgot I was going back to look through what he was saying about religion. Um, I'm, on, I'm actually on the wrong thing here. My bad. Hold on. I was looking, you had said something about Marx. I was going to see if I could find something real quick. But this is he uh, um, uh, that is Perry pulled together um, here this 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 10 week course in the racial aspects of world history that, that mm. Harrison was working on in, mm -hmm. in, in 1927. Mm -hmm. And it's just fascinating to see where his mind, how he, you know, to the extent we could, you know, learn from this, how he was sort of parsing things out in his head. But um, it's just fascinating to see some of this stuff. Uh, um, the white races rise to power and privilege. My favorite though, as I highlighted here, is the collapse of the Caucasian, a forecast. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. Oh my goodness. If, if, if ever I would have wished to have a tape recorder and a YouTube channel for my man, like that, the collapse of the Caucasian, like, like anybody in 2023 that needs a, like a, like a hot YouTube, you know what I mean? This is an algorithmically friendly, uh, hit clickbait. Mm -hmm. Not that you could do probably what Harrison was going to do with it, but that's a good one right there. The collapse. Of the <laughs> so anyway, but I was just, you know, anyway, just thinking about what, you know, he's talking about, um, I mean, even things that are still, again, to your point about what's relevant now, China and the power, mm -hmm. Soviet Russia, it's bearing on white rulership over the darker, over darker races. Mm -hmm. um, we got BRICS happening right now. The Brown Bridge of Britain's empire from in Egypt to India, you know, like, so, you know, the, the, the anti the, the anti uh, uh, British imperial, uh, um, you know, BRICS uh, evolution that's happening now with some of the, at least one of those nations involved. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so anyway, it's just it's just interesting to. Uh, um, so so I did want to ask you sort of like as 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 where you saw him heading. If there's any way to, you know, or what, what, yeah, any thoughts about where you saw Harrison heading and what, what, uh, um, yeah, what that might mean for us now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, one of the things that's difficult uh, that has been, that has made it harder, I think, to preserve his memory is that he, he wasn't affiliated with one single organization. Um, or ideological framework, you know, for, for a long period of time. Um, you know, first he's in the Socialist Party, he's trying to get them to take race seriously, they won't have it, so he leaves the Socialist Party, forms the Liberty League, which in many ways creates uh, a catalyst for the rise of Garvey and Garveyism. Um, he's, in, he's in the UNIA, he's editing the Negro World, but then he's developing cr criticisms of Garvey Right. Um, so he ends up breaking with Garvey and, and leaving the UNIA. Um, and then, you know, his last organizational project um, was a formation called the International Colored Unity League, which um, was a Pan-African formation. It was meant to, to, to organize um, African-Americans, Afro-Caribbeans and continental Africans together, much like the Liberty League had done. Um, but with more of a, it was very much, you could see the influence of, of Garveyism, right? And the project or the idea of building a global black nationality, which is, which is really at the core of what Garvey was trying to do in many ways, um, in it, at least in terms of, you know, one of, one of the, the, the great positive um, influences and aspects of that, given that there, there were so few African peoples that, that had any control of, of over a government, right? This is a time when European colonialism 
uh, was ruling over most of Africa, apart from, you know, Abyssinia and Liberia. And so most African peoples, peoples in the world were colonized uh, by some, some or another European power. And um, so the idea of, of nationality, of black nationality, um, which was also transterritorial, right? It wasn't necessarily something that you could fix within, the, within borders per se. Um, that's something that Harrison applies um, in the International Colored Unity League, for example, in its call for a separate state, um, what I call a territorial resolution of the land question for African-Americans. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that happens um, during the process of enslavement and colonization and so forth is that people people are made landless, right? And so there's a, there's a history of 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 efforts to achieve land. We could talk about forty acres and a mule after the Civil War. We could talk about um, you know Cyril Briggs uh, actually calls for a separate state. Garveyism, of course, is talking about Africa, Africa for the Africans, building on a 19th century tradition of black of black nationalism um, that was very much, you know, uh, in in that line. Um, later on in the 30s or well, in the 20s, you know, late 20s and 30s, you have the Communist Party's black belt thesis, right, calling for self-determination for the black belt. And then in the 60s, you have forces like the Republic of New Africa, um, which are saying, you know, they want to create a territory. Uh, in the five southern states of the U.S., the Black Belt, essentially, where Black people, African Americans, uh, were most concentrated, um, and so Harrison is a part of that trajectory. You and know. the Nation of Islam was is 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 still has that on their agenda, uh, mm -hmm. as recently as just a couple of years ago. I was mm -hmm. even present at an event, present at an event myself, mm -hmm. uh, where 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 that that was uh, on the table. So anyway, just as yeah, just, and, and Malcolm X, right. Famously, uh, as part of the as as part of the Nation of Islam, 1963 message to the grassroots, he's saying, you know, the Russian Revolution was about land. The French Revolution was about land. Like it's, it's the landless against the landlord. Um, you know, Harrison is a part of that trajectory. In 1924, the, the International Colored Colored mm -hmm. Unity League is calling for um, land, right? A separate territorial way of working out some of these issues of uh, racial oppression that African Americans. Are experiencing so I think that's I think that's a, an underemphasized um, aspect of our history that there's this broad support across a number of different political forces and figures over time and space for um, resolving this this issue of landlessness you know so in addition to lynching in addition to segregation in addition to police brutality in addition to a number of aspects of anti-black racial oppression, landlessness is one of them. And um, and so that's something that I think is is really interesting to kind of think about um, and what that what that means for for our sense of sovereignty, our sense of of you know dignity. I mean I just I just bought a house a couple of years ago um, for the first time and it, like just on a, on a small individual level I was like wow like I I have a piece of land for myself. You know, it was kind of a new feeling, something I hadn't ever experienced before. Um, apart from when I'm in Kenya, you know, with with my dad's people, especially up country, you know, in our ancestral land. Um, well, enjoy it because at least for me, very quickly, the other questions about nationalism settle in uh, uh, in terms of uh, you, you you get that sense of of yeah, I got a little plot of land, but now can I defend it? How permanent mm. is my hold over this land? Mm. Is it real even? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Like, like, it, it, it. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's a big difference between, you know, having an individual plot of land with your house on it versus a collective political struggle to resolve, you know, a world historic crime against our humanity of making us landless um and then oddly for me it's still it, it's still a little weird like being sort of an apartment baby all my life it was yeah, like yeah this all of a sudden having this much room was uncomfortable it was like unsafe even i was like <laughs> like you, you, all like your just, life you fantasize about having room right and it's like i got too much space <laughs> wait a minute i feel vulnerable <laughs> like where's the, i like that yeah, anyway so yeah anyway yeah. but uh, but the, the other thing i wanted to yeah. say just in terms sure. of less, lessons for now lessons from harrison um you know i i, I mentioned the, the hnic problem one of the most beautiful things about harrison's thought is what i call his radical humility 
for example, he, he was very clear about the need for Africans in the diaspora not to teach Africans, right? Because many people had this colonial conception, not just white colonizers, but even African-Americans um, had this notion that we're going to teach Africans, we're going to civilize them, we're going to develop them, right? Um, and Harrison had the opposite. He's like, we need to learn from Africa. We need to see what they have to teach us, right? There's this profound humility uh, towards Africa and African people that Harrison exhibits, um, which is exactly the kind of profound humility that I think we, we need to cultivate more widely, a humility towards working people and poor people, right? A humility towards those who, who do not um, maybe think like us or act like us around the world, right? Um, I mean, in the US, we have this whole US exceptionalism and cultural imperialism that makes us think that we got nothing to learn from anybody else. Um, so I think that that sense of humility is is really powerful. Harrison, you know, he was averse to the limelight. He, he didn't like uh, even praise bothered him when people would praise him. It made him feel uncomfortable. Um, so and, and that's, I think, in some ways to a fault and, and contributed to his historical erasure in certain ways that, that he that he did sort of shy from the, the limelight oftentimes. Um, but there's there's wisdom in that. There's lessons in that. Right. And, the, and there's there's a power in humility. Anyway, um, maybe he should have done, he should have, well, for what it would have been his time, he should have written a song about being humble. <laughs> anyway, um, we do have some uh, uh, some good comments and questions and, and, and from, uh, uh, I'd like to work in at least a sure. little bit here if possible. First of all, a welcome Calm Leash Canine Training. If, if, if you haven't been greeted as a new member, welcome. Yeah, uh, Musa, I don't know if you saw this. I know you're in the chat now, I think, but you did punk me and we'll have to talk about that another time uh, with your little cupcake uh, suggestion. That was, that was shady. My students had a very good laugh at my expense last night. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 anyway. Um, yeah, so Josh is asking, why are you saying free lover and not cheater? <laughs> <laughs> we respect him on his birthday. That's why, Josh, you give him a little bit of room on his birthday. He's 140, man. Come on now. Come on now. Uh, speaking of Musa, what are some of the first readings by and about uh, Harrison that y'all recommend? Um, the the one we mentioned for sure, When Africa Awakes. Uh, um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, that's, go ahead. Yeah. That's a great starting point if you want. Harrison's book, you know, his own, his own, uh, you know, work to, to compile his work. Uh, when Africa Awakes uh, is, is a great place to start if you want to just get his ideas directly. Um, Perry published as well um, the Hubert Harrison Reader, which is a compilation of a number of Harrison's writings uh, with Perry's annotations that is very, very useful and, and covers a broader range than, um, than When Africa Awakes. Um, I think those two are really the, the best available um, sort of published published writings of Harrison that are still in print in, in, in terms of, you know, right now. Um, the other question was, oh. Yeah, yeah go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it's free love versus cheater. So uh, I just wanted to say something about that because oh, okay. one, of the, one of the things I learned in doing research um, on this is that there is, um, even in the white community, you know, European Americans have a tradition of sex radicalism and free love uh, advocacy going back at least to the 19th century. And, um, and what's fascinating about it is um, they, were, they, were very, they were very explicit about the sort of oppressive nature. And many of these were women, by the way, white women's rights advocates who chafed at the oppressive nature of marriage because they saw it as a way of making women into property um, and instead advocated, you know, uh, what they used to call variety in, in terms of romantic relationships. People like Emma Goldman, uh, Victoria Woodhull, um, and, and a whole number of folks, um, you know. And so, it, so I had to understand, like, that tradition and that legacy. Also, opposing the government criminalization of sexuality was something that they were very active in doing and fighting for free speech because so much of that was the criminalization of speech when you're saying, you know, uh, sending erotic literature through the mails is quote unquote obscene and therefore illegal. 
um, a lot of these folks had to be free, free speech advocates, even just to be free lovers. Uh, whether they wanted to be free speech advocates or not, it would just it came with the territory. Um, now it's a little more difficult in the in the case of Black communities. I think there is a tradition, a free love tradition in Black communities. Um, you know, on the on the on the plantation. I mean, folks. Were, first of all, we're not allowed to get married, <laughs> whether monogamously or otherwise. Um, and second of all, you know, because kinship structures were so much more fluid, right? Somebody comes in from another plantation, someone gets bought or sold off to another, right? Like kinship is very different. It's not the sort of white Western Eurocentric nuclear family model. It never was, right? Um, it wasn't that way in Africa because of plural marriage and polygamy. And it wasn't that way on the plantation in the so-called new world. Um, so this is part of the work, the research I'm trying to do and sort of rethinking some of some of these things um, to even to even talk about a black free love politics right or or a, or a, or a tradition um, that is you know both learning from and connected to some of the white sex radicals and free love and free speech and free thinkers because um, that was another component right challenging the church you almost have to challenge the church if you want to be um, doing anything apart from the compulsory monogamy that the church and state you know, had mandated um, at, a, at a national and, and, and local level. Um, there's, there's a whole world of things to explore here. I feel, and, 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 and I have see, I've seen very little um, written about this, even in the literature on black sexualities, right? A lot of mm. it is about queer, queer, you know, um, radical feminists, like those kind of things, which is great and, and interesting and important. But, but when it comes to free love or black polyamory, right? That is not a very well-researched subject, um, but, mm. uh, but I think there's a lot of room and fruitful sort of fertile ground um, from which to, to, draw, to draw on um, to learn new things about, about how we relate, you know, and, and why it is that the sort of traditional monogamous marriage um, often doesn't work, <laughs> right, for, for many people, um, and is in many ways unnatural when you look at the history of human sexuality across time and space and across cultures. Um, books like Sex at Dawn just blew my mind. I mean, I just encountered that book very recently. Um, but but you, you realize there's a lot more to the story here. And even radical leftist, Marxist, whatever, pan-Africanist, this, this is an area that we, I think, have, have not looked at closely enough. No disrespect to the very happy monogamous relationship that I'm in. <laughs> there is zero chance this is natural to humanity. Zero. <laughs> because I'm a zero. There's zero chance. I, I, it cannot possibly be that this is the, 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 the natural course. This is not, definitely an imposition uh, as not, an institution. Read, um, read Sex at Dawn. You'll realize yeah. There's nothing natural. No, I've heard reference to that. I've not read it, but I've heard it mentioned. Uh, and I should add it, we'll add it to the long list of books I probably will not get to. But, but um, you know, but, but you're yeah, right. No, the, I, point is, the point is, you're right. You know, I mean, you know, something like 95% of 95% of, uh, of species in nature are not monogamous, right? No other social or group living primate uh, is sexually monogamous. Um, I mean, these are, these are cultural culturally specific, church specific, Western Eurocentric specific. I know you got us operating at a high level here, but but all you need is Game of Thrones, man. Marriage is not about love and sustainability. This is it's about imposition, violence, property. empire, conquering yes. property, mm -hmm. control. Anyway, no, I'm just playing, but but seriously, I do I think that's generally the, the way I, I think the history, even outside of Europe, bears out. Uh, in a lot of ways, but uh, um, anyway, right on. Um, Big Teal is asking, what are you teaching next fall? <laughs> Great question. Uh, so I'm teaching my, my African-American history class, which I teach basically every, every semester. And I'm teaching a new course uh, called the History of Black Revolutions. Um, and so we're gonna look at everything from the Zanj Rebellion, right? Oh, in snap. Ninth century Iraq. Uh, a rebellion of enslaved Africans against their Arab Arab rulers um, to the Haitian Revolution, right? Which is one of the most important um, events, I think, in, in world history as far as black liberation, black people are, are concerned. 
um, the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, um, and a whole number of, you know, again, black revolutions and, and, and revolutionaries. Um, it's a new course. I've never taught it before. So hopefully, uh, you know, it'll go well and, uh, and we'll have Please some share that syllabus. Please <laughs> share. That's, that's, that sounds fascinating. Congratulations on that one for sure. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I just just highlighted. I thought Craig, it was, yeah, the afterlives of Harrison, just in terms of the precious prescientness. I think uh, mm. was the point there. Um, same thing. Uh, Hubert Henry Harris, Hubert Harrison's politics and life work are an embodiment of dialectical struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a specific question here: Please ask, did Hubert Henry Hubert feel? How did Hubert feel about Garvey's deportation? And did he try to help Garvey during his persecution by the evil imperialist? Mm. Good question. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, some people have claimed that, um, I mean, uh, there was this huge Garvey must go campaign, um, which kicks off in earnest, especially after 1922, when Garvey meets with the Klan. Um, you know, he, Garvey and the Klan had some overlap in terms of, their commitment to racial purity and separation. And this pissed off a lot of African-Americans, um, particularly some folks in the NAACP, um, who literally launched a campaign uh, along with Cyril Briggs and others to try to get Garvey deported um, and kicked out of the country. And um, some people have tried to claim that Harrison was a part of this. Um, I've not seen any evidence of that. Um, <laughs> but part of the reason I think for why uh, Harrison didn't call for Garvey's deportation is because uh, he thought Garvey was destined to end up in, quote, a room where he can't hurt his head when he hits it against the walls because those walls will be padded. Um, <laughs> I mean, Harrison had a, a very cr strong and specific critique of a whole number of things uh, as it relates to Garvey. You know, he saw Garvey as, as misusing people's money, um, he saw Garvey as trying to invade Africa with this kind of imperial vision. Um, he saw Garvey as um, performing a number of what he called cowardly evasions on the question of lynching. Um, mm. And there's, there's just a whole number of things that Harrison is, is critical about when it comes to Garvey. Garvey's ego, his sort of egomania, um, his lying. He said Garvey has plastered the air with lies. Uh, in, in his comments about the first UNIA convention, um, claiming that there were 20,000 delegates or 25,000 delegates at this convention, um, which really doesn't add up when you look at the facts of the hundred and some people who signed the Declaration of Negro Rights, um, the, the hundred or so people who were voting in the convention, right? Um, there were probably about 150 or 200 delegates, uh, actual elected delegates or people who were official delegates uh, but when they had the parade and 20,000 people came out to see the UNIA parade, Garvey says, these are all delegates, right? Um, so there's a number of, of, I mean, this is, this is what's so fascinating about, and I have two chapters in my book about Garvey and Garveyism, because on the one hand, Harrison plays this crucial and decisive role in Gar the rise of Garvey and Garveyism. And on the other hand, as as it becomes this huge thing, Harrison starts critiquing it and seeing Garvey's limitations and problems with it. Um, and he's very, he's very unfiltered, especially in his diary, right? Harrison, his diary, he's writing about, and the diary is online, uh, by the way, if people want to to look at some of this stuff. Columbia University has digitized um, a number of documents in the Harrison archive. Um, and Harrison is, is very unsparing in his criticism uh, of, of what he sees the problems with, with Garvey uh, being. And, um, and yet, you know, he's so still... Wait, are, so, so, so are these accusations baseless when it, it, that, that uh, 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 um, when he's saying these things about Garvey, particularly his, his cowardice against lynching? And, and, and by the way, I, this... Um, where you were in part quoting from is, is in Perry's work here that, that he says personally, 
Harrison considered Garvey to have a defect in the size of his soul and viewed him spiritually as well as intellectually as a little man, complete with delusions of grandeur and persecution, insane hoggishness, jealousy of successful subordinates, ingratitude, greed for domination, ignorance, bombastic blabbling. A speaker, he thought he was, as a speaker, he thought he was a joke and silly uh, rotomentades. I don't even know what that word is, to be honest with you. Insincere boasting, bombastic babbling, cowardice, cowardly evasions on lynching, lies, and changing policy. So, I mean, that is a lot. That's, that's, that's a lot. So, was, I mean, I was joking before, but I mean, that's what I was saying about these YouTube beefs. Like, these are like, it's very YouTube ish when you read uh, uh, some of that. But, or feels that way, but but was there substance? Did he have receipts, as we might say today, for these accusations? And 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 anyway, how baseless could it be said that those claims were, as far as Harrison's perspective? Yeah, so so I, I have a whole chapter on this this subject of of not just Harrison's criticisms, but also Harrison's attempts to push the UNIA in, in, a, in a different direction, as I mentioned, a more class conscious and anti-imperialist direction. Um, but yeah, I mean, Harrison had firsthand, I mean, when Garvey comes to, to, to Harlem, it's Harrison's Liberty League that gives Garvey his very first mass audience in Harlem. When Garvey speaks at that inaugural meeting of Harrison's Liberty League, uh, Harrison joined. is that the one where he falls off the stage and Harrison literally helps him back up? Is that no, the no, famous, no. infamous? That was, I'm not trying to make fun. I'm because I, I actually thought that was a, a yeah, no, that was that was an earlier incident okay, when, okay. when um before the Liberty League was formed. I think okay. when Garvey first came to New York before he stood, did his his tour of the, of the U.S., um, yeah, he literally fell off the stage. Um, but um, but Harrison, the point is that Harrison had had first-hand observation, not just in the Liberty League, which Garvey had joined, but also um, in the UNIA headquarters, the Harlem headquarters. Harrison is editing the Negro world. He's observing Garvey, you know, give speeches. He's observing him up close in other settings. Um, Harrison had a very, you know, Harrison, as A. Philip Randolph put it, it was the father of Harlem radicalism. So Harrison had an immense authority. He was brilliant intellectually, genius level intellect. Um, and and he, he had opportunity to observe Garvey in very close and internal settings from within. And that's what's different about Harrison's criticisms of Garvey. It's not like a Du Bois or a Cyril Briggs um, who have, you know, this organizational competition, right? And who are organizational rivals with Garvey in terms of the NAACP in Du Bois's case or the ABB and, and Communist Party uh, of Briggs. Right. Harrison is a dues paying UNIA member. He is editing the Negro World, Garvey's newspaper. His criticisms are from within. Right. And they are and they're they're coming from the person who taught Garvey race first. Right. So so they're they're a different type of criticism. They have, I think, more authority in some ways um, for, for these reasons. Mm. And um and there's a whole there's a, there's there's a whole number of things. I mean, the, the list you just read, Jared, uh, of those charges, um, I go I go into depth with with a number of those charges and and try to flesh out what does Harrison mean when he says this? What is what is his uh, why is he making these types of assessments? I mean, just to give one example, Harrison was initially going to be um, the chair of the first UNI, UNIA delegation to Liberia. Right to try to get permission from the Liberian government to set up a UNIA sort of colony there, um, and Harrison's complaint about Garvey is that, uh, in terms of the bombastic babbling, was that Garvey was um, wanted to put this plan, this colonization plan, into the Negro world, and Harrison, as editor of the Negro World, is like, no, we shouldn't actually speak openly and publicly about this because it's going to be harder for us to get passports from the State Department if they know what we're up to. And Garvey, according to Harrison, was like, no, no, it's good propaganda. Put it in. So they put it in the Negro world. Sure enough, the State Department, U.S. military intelligence, the U.S. government and so on are like, oh, UNA wants to set up things and deny them passports. And, uh, and, and, and that's exactly what ends up, what ends up happening, right? Uh, makes it harder for that delegation to get off the ground because they're, they're not able to get the passports for what they want to do due to, according to Harrison, Garvey's penchant for just 
bombastically babbling, regardless of the sort of strategic, um, you know, risks that might be involved with showing the enemy all your cards all the time. Um, so that's just one example. But specific the to is, the issue of, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. The, the, point is that, the, point is that, the point is that there is, is a lot of substance to these charges that, that you listed off, Jared, and we may not have time to go into all of them right now. Well, I, I, I did want to ask specifically about the lynching one. Can we talk, like, sure. what, what was sure. his point about Garvey's relationship to, to, to lynching? Why was he so upset at Garvey sure. for that? Sure. sure. Um, so basically, um, and we have to understand that before Harrison's in, in the UNIA, he, he had founded the Liberty League, which, among other things, was protesting lynching and disfranchisement, right? Which, uh, that was a, a big part of the Liber Liberty League program, is, is, is not only protesting lynching, but also pushing for federal anti-lynching legislation. Um, and, you know, Garvey, to his credit, did once in a while issue a, a sort of rhetorical threat that the UNIA would lynch a white man for every lynched black person. Um, but in reality, he did not make agitation against lynching a central or consistent part of UNIA pro the UNIA program or, or objectives. Um, and in fact, Garvey denounced efforts to pass federal anti-lynching legislation on the grounds that it was just an attempt by white Republicans to appease black people and, we be, and would be unenforceable um, in practice. I mean, there's even one report of, of Garvey thanking white Southerners for lynching race consciousness into black people. Um, and we know that he met with the Klan and had certain things in common with their racial purity and separate, separatist uh, you know, ideology. Um, and so I think part of what's going on here is that Harrison is disappointed that you know, the work he did in the Liberty League, including some of the lessons he tried to impart to Garvey during that time, 1917 to, to 1819, um, that Garvey didn't really take that aspect to heart, you know, in a consistent way, right? Or in a way that, um, that Harrison felt was necessary, you know, pressuring the government to do more about lynching, denouncing lynching more consistently, um, and making that a central part of, you know, Black uh, activity and resistance to racial oppression. Right on. Thank you very much. Uh, let me at least get this one in here as well from Geechee. Shout out to, to Geechee. Uh, by the way, we'll be back tomorrow with Earn Your Liberation, 8 o'clock a.m. Uh, bright and early with Geechee and Brother Diallo. And then later on tomorrow, uh, I'll be joined by Tanda Sizwe Chimaranga for another discussion uh, with her views on the uh, Fendi Shakur and uh, Dear Mama uh, documentary. Um, so please, you know, calendar it up or whatever needs to happen so that you're ready for all of that. But what do you think about this here? Um, what, what do you think about communism or Pan-Africanism by G George Padmore? Does, did, does, did Harris, actually, I can't remember the timing of the book. Yeah. So, so that, that oh, book, ahead, yeah. That book uh, comes comes after Padmore's experience, you know, in the Communist Party um, right. as, as this sort of leading black organizer and editor, um, which is after Harrison, you know, dies. Harrison dies in 1927. Right. Um, Padmore's experience and disillusionment with the Communist Party takes place in the 1930s. So Harrison wasn't alive to see that, but right. I can say that 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 book is part of um, this larger history that Harrison as well as a part of, of black radicals going into white leftist organizations, whether it's the Socialist Party or later the Communist Party, realizing they have some limitations, uh, particularly around questions of race and you know, Pan-African pro-black politics, leaving those organizations, right? And then going on to do more pro-black or Pan-African things afterward. Um, there's a whole number of figures who we could talk about um, in that fold, Padmore, Harrison, um, even A. Philip Randolph, right, who's in the Socialist Party, uh, and then he leaves the Socialist Party to work on the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, organizing black workers just exactly like the Socialist Party wouldn't do. Um, the only problem, and I admit that, you know, I, there's a, probably a number of flaws with this as an approach, but I, the only problem that I have with, with, with all of that is that according to Francis Stoner Saunders, British intelligence and their allies loved Padmore's book and loved 
that he chose pan-Africanism over communism and had so much negative things to say. Now, obviously, that was their Cold War concern, mm -hmm. but it, it's just that that initial, if they like it, I have to hate it, uh, um, you know, does kick in a little bit, uh, even as I'm sure they weren't, you know, looking to make whatever final assessment of the, ve the variety of pan-Africanism he was looking to engage. But but it's yeah, that was just yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the pro the, pro the problem there um, is that is that figures like Padmore did veer into a certain kind of anti-communism, right? That is, they took their experience. Uh, their disillusioning experience with with white left or Eurocentric leftists in the Communist Party and became anti-communist. That is not just against the racism of these particular communists, but against communism more generally as as an idea or even as as a political goal. Um, and 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 again, it's it's sad because you know I think the 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 white left historically. Um, has has essentially forced black people into this kind of black nationalist position, whether or not they ultimately see that as as the most liberatory politic, because they're unable to stay in these white leftist formations that that don't accommodate um, and don't actually practice what they preach. Right? I mean, the, the socialist and communist parties, for example, claim to be representing workers of the world. They claim to stand for proletarian emancipation. But as Harrison and others have always pointed out, the most thoroughly proletarian element in this country is African-Americans because they were brought here for the purpose of labor. They were brought here as enslaved laborers, right? There's no other group in this country that is as thoroughly proletarian as African-Americans, yet somehow uh, the white left has not taken black, the black worker, so to speak, uh, as their theoretical or practical starting point. And so um, that then forces a situation where um, you you have to sort of you have to have some critique, right, of of the practice, if not the theory, um, of of these organizations. And unfortunately, I think it does lead um, some people like Padmore and others into a, a kind of right wing anti communism, right, a sort of rejection of class consciousness as something that is valuable, necessary, crucial, and decisive for resisting capitalism, imperialism, and all the rest of it. Um, and so I, I, I see that that problem, but I think this is this is fundamentally a problem of, of, of the whiteness or the Eurocentrism or the anti-blackness to be most specific uh, of, of the left. That's why, again, just humbly for me, a little bit of Nkrumahism, Tereism, So, you know, solves a lot of those yeah. contra you know, just yeah. you know, just a little just a little dash yeah. we, 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 of that we, on there. You know what I mean? Walter you know? That's why we need to study Walter Rodney. We need to study CLR James, the Black Jacobins. And we need, you know, Amilcar Cabral, right? And there's all these figures that are doing a kind of class conscious or even sort of Marxist um, work, but taking having a different starting point. You, you know, Du Bois and Black Reconstruction starts with the Black worker. Um, you know, and we can critique, as Saidiya Hartman does, you know, the way in which he sort of elides the reproductive labor of women and the, and the, the care labor mm. of black women. Uh, mm. We can have that. That's a great critique. And, you know, but mm. the point is, like, <laughs> the point is that, that, that black workers cannot cannot be the most proletarian, uh, you know, whether they're in the Caribbean and CLR James's black Jacobins or in the U.S., African Americans, in, in, as in Black Reconstruction, we can't we can't have them as the most proletarian and not, you know, not do something with that, right? Not not take that seriously. So I'm definitely against the kind of right wing anti communism or the conservative rejection of class struggle politics um, that some figures have been led into, given the limitations of the white left. Mm, mm, right on. Uh, and, and yeah, it sounds the same elsewhere. That that is true. Uh, that I wouldn't be surprised if some reactionary Garveyites clip parts of this conversation either. But you know, you know. But all jokes aside, I mean, we 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 have to be able to have these conversations. And I do know that that there there are um, uh, my Garveyite sisters and brothers who watch this program, and they're always welcome. Nobody nobody is nobody is you know everybody's welcome. Uh, but but we can't not talk about the original Triple H. We can't, you know, we can't, you know what I mean? We can't, you know what I mean? Like, like we can't 
so that's all like you know yeah anyway, and, and, um, and the other thing the other thing about that is that what i found in garvey movement historiography is there's this there's this gap this silence where the towering influence of harrison should be um, uh, i mean race first is one example right the mass movement orientation rather than tuskegee institute building orientation right um the african consciousness right a lot of these things are coming directly from Harrison to Garvey, right? Ireland. I mean, Robert Hill talks about Ireland as doing more than any other foreign movement um, to focus Garvey's nationalism, the Irish national movement, movement for, for Irish liberation. You don't find any comments about that in the Garvey papers before Garvey's tenure in Harrison's Liberty League. On the other hand, you find a lot of voice editorials, Harrison's newspaper, um, which tells us a lot about Liberty League politics and conversation. You find a lot about Ireland. You find Harrison saying, we need to learn from the Irish. We need to do like the Sinn Feiners do, right? Organize ourselves on a platform politically as black people first, before we then try to relate to some of these other white political formations. Um, and so there's so many- So he was a Malcolm X voter before Malcolm X. Message. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, exactly, exactly. Anyway, the point the point is just that um, people should check out my article in, in the Journal of African American History on Harrison and the Gar the rise of, of the Garvey movement because um, I think Garvey scholars have really missed a key central, not the only influence, but a certainly key central, decisive, and catalyzing influence on Marcus Garvey and the rise of of Garveyism. I don't think Garvey I don't think we would have a thing called Garveyism which is you know, the namesake of Marcus Garvey and Amy Ashwood Garvey, um, we wouldn't have that. And it, not, certainly not in the way that, that it um, emerged and evolved without the influence of Hubert Henry Harris. Ooh, that's, that's strong. That's strong. Thanks for the super, super chat, Nelson Mercer. Come out ye black and tans. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Listen, listen. Um, so you've, you've made reference to your work several times here. Where, where, where is it? I will, I will get caught up and we will, we're going to have to do um, more because I haven't read your work yet on, mm. on, on Harrison. Mm. So, so where is it? How do we all get it? Um, and then, you know, be in, be be on ready alert in your emails for 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 the next invitation. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I don't have a lot uh, published at this time. I do have the article I just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, which you can you can find if you just if you look up Journal of African American History uh, with my name or or look up you know Hubert Harrison and the rise of the Garvey movement. I think it's the title is Pebbles and Ripples. Uh, mm. Hubert Harrison and the rise of the Garvey movement. I think something to that effect, if I'm, if I'm, my memory serves me. It came out a couple of years ago, 2020, I think um, it came out. Um, but the other big, the, the big, I mean, the big kahuna is my book. Um, I have a book on, on Harrison um, that is uh, most likely, you know, coming out next year, uh, 2024. And um, that's going to be like the big kahuna. It's going to be, the, it's going to be the, the, I'll be only the second person to have a book length treatment of Harrison, right? Perry is the first, Perry has the reader and the two volume biography. No other scholar that I'm aware of has, has, has done a book length, uh, mm. you know, treatment of Harrison. We've had articles here and there. We've had a book chapter here and there from other scholars, right? Um, but a whole book on Harrison, you know, I'll be the, only the second one to, to do that. So that, Stay tuned for that because a lot of this stuff is, is going to be a lot of the stuff I've shared today and even with even more detail um, is going to be forthcoming in that book, uh, which is coming out on UNC Press. Congratulations in advance. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. And uh, um, but we may have to we, we may have to get another preview conversation before it comes out. Uh, I don't see waiting until next year to, to have a part two. <laughs> okay. Um, and again, shout out to Nelson Mercer for the super chat. I can never remember to clarify that black and tans in that song refers to, I think, black British uniforms and it feels important to give that context. Okay. Thank you for that. 
and thank you for the super chat. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I'm not clear on that reference, so I'll I'll defer to to the to to, to Nelson on that, and and thank you for that. Um, Dr. Quobo, thank you very much. It's been great, and and uh, I'm sorry we don't have more time today, but but uh, uh, I can't think of a better way to spend a, a, a Thursday morning afternoon, especially. Uh, on the anniversary of Hubert Henry Harrison's birthday. This has been fantastic and congratulations again in advance and cannot wait to the work comes out and, and for the several conversations I look forward to having with you going forward. So thank you very thank much. Thank you so much, Jared. I, I appreciate being here and I appreciate uh, your invitation, you know, to, to speak here, to come back. Um, I've been quiet for a number of years, in part because I don't have tenure yet, but I am happy to say I'm up for tenure this year, um, just waiting on on the meeting of the trustees in June to, to, to hear the final word. Um, As the one call Slick once said, knock them out the box, Rick. Knock them <laughs> out, Rick. Go get that bad boy. Con you know, you. I congratulations in advance on that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Best. Best. Yeah. And, and happy birthday to Hubert Henry Harrison. Yes, sir. Uh, happy, happy birthday. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. All right, Thank my you. man. Peace. Take good care. I can't wait till next time. Thanks again. Thank you. Likewise, brother. Thanks so much for all the work you're doing. We love you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Appreciate. You. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Wow, 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 wow. That was dope. That was dope. That was dope. So make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Make sure you ring that, that notification bell, because come on now. Come on now. Even if you don't fully agree with everything or everybody, come on now. You cannot front on how dope that was. Happy birthday to Hubert Henry Harrison. Uh, to all the remixers, thank you very much for coming through. Apologies if we didn't get to your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Um, but let's continue the conversation. Uh, and as always, if you got more to say, put it in the comments. And we'll be back with more. So ma again, make sure you got the bell like, uh, rung so that you don't miss anything. Back with Earn Your Liberation tomorrow morning and much more on the platform. Time to seize Wei Chimaranga tomorrow afternoon. And I'm not even entirely sure what else is coming on the platform. So that's why I have the bell rung so I don't miss things. Peace if you're willing to fight for it, like Fred Hampton used to say. Catch you next time right here at I Mix What I Like. Thanks again, everybody. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.